Hello, Rebecca Radil here. Welcome to the final event of HistFest 2021. It's been such a wonderful weekend and from HistFest and the British Library, I'd like to sincerely thank you all for joining us. Please do check out future HistFest events via the website www.histfest.org. Now, I can think of no better person to close the festival than a man whose work on screen and in print has inspired so many people to take up history, Professor Michael Wood. For those of you joining us for this event in particular, I just first of all need to run through a couple of pieces of housekeeping. Using the menu above, you can provide feedback to the event um, and also, if you wish, donate to the British Library. The Library is a charity, so your support really does help to open up a world of inspiration and learning to everyone. Your feedback is also incredibly important in helping the Library to plan future cultural events. You can also find a tab on the menu with a link to the bookshop where you can buy, buy or browse a range of titles um, from many of the festival authors and speakers. Also, one final thing, below the video there is a box for you to submit questions and there will be a short Q&A after Michael's talk. And there's also information and social media links there should you wish to continue the conversation after the event on other platforms. Please do use the hashtag HistFest2021. Now, without further ado, I am delighted to hand you over to our event sponsors to introduce our final event, Ethelfled. Lady of the Mercians. Welcome to Sick to Death in Chester. We are very proud to be the headline sponsor for this talk by Michael Wood. We are a new history of medicine museum in Chester where uh, we explore the story of how human beings uh, have done all they can, can to keep this chap at bay. Death, say hello Death. Hello. One of our staff, so you'll get to meet Death and, and, and his counterpart, Medicine. Uh, as you visit here and all set in the historic city of Chester which has a very special and pertinent link with the subject of today's talk, uh, the Lady of the Mercians, Ethel Flader. So um, enjoy your talk and come and visit us soon. Thanks Rebecca, thanks everybody, great to see you in Chester and thank you the audience for being with us tonight. Thank you for supporting the Hist Fest, which uh, um, has been a, a recent phenomenon, uh, and especially due to the drive and vision of Rebecca herself. And uh, uh, I hope that we can all meet again in person for the next one. Um, I hope, and I hope that's not too long either. It's a wonderful place, the British Library, to hold events like this, uh, and. Uh, uh, I hope we can all get together soon. I'm talking to you tonight about uh, um, the Lady of the Mercians, uh, variously pronounced Ethel Fleder, um, a still current name in my grandparents' time, but Ethel Flood in, in Anglo-Saxon, in Old English, let's put it that way. Um, just a brief note on her life. Uh, she was born um, in around... 870 perhaps. Um, she died in 918 and she's one of the most interesting people in British history. Uh, she reigned the Mercian Kingdom in the Midlands for 32 years. Astonishing in, in the early medieval period in the age of the Vikings. The last eight of those years on her own after her husband's death. So it's an extraordinary story and I'm going to try and tell you that story as best I can tonight. Um, but it's also a really interesting case of the erasure of women's history, because were it not for a, uh, a small chronicle written probably in Worcester during her lifetime, which was later edited into uh, manuscripts of the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, we would never know the bulk of her story. So it's a truly intriguing tale. And I really want to try and look tonight at uh, the possibilities of biography, if you like. Um, for people of that period, biography is a very difficult thing to manage. The, the inwardness of people's lives, what did they think? What did they feel? Very hard to get at, especially when it's expressed in what the great Eric Auerbach called the, the veil of scholarly Latin. But fortunately with people like Athelflad and her father, Alfred the Great, um, we've got vernacular texts as well. So there's some possibility amid the fragments of reconstructing the life of this extraordinary woman, uh, 
woman. And that's what I'm going to try and do today. Um, uh, a woman, as this text in front of you says, the lady of the Mercians, a woman of extraordinary prudentia and justitia. These are the classic virtues of male kingship, prudentia, justitia, justice, uh, of outstanding virtus, strength of character, and yet these are applied to a woman. Um, so the possibilities of biography, but first of all, I can't resist this. Um, of course, there's been a huge uh, interest in her over the last few years, especially with the anniversary in 2018, of the uh, 900 years, is, it, is that right? Uh, 1100 years um, and Bernard Cornwell's last kingdom series on the BBC there she is um, the feisty modern heroine how we imagine the people of the past here's the publicity blurb she's the daughter of Alfred and Al Swith uh, strong brave and intelligent a mind as thoughtful as her father's and a will as strong as her mother's we don't know about the will of her mother but the same virtues of prudentia and uh, justitia, of constantia, firmness of purpose. Um, we still understand those things, don't we? Even though it's very difficult to enter into the lives of a woman of that period. And in the last few years, people have really tried, although there is no full length biography or study of her uh, in an academic sense, there's been a plethora of books. We've even got her autobiography. What wouldn't we give for that? Um, many ways of imagining her, consonant with our modern ideas about uh, women of strength. Sometimes even she appears as a kind of wonder woman, vanquishing her Danish and Viking foes. Um, her story goes back a long way. Her myth goes back a long way. Uh, post the Norman conquest, there were a lot of short accounts of her. Uh, this one, interestingly, the Chayworth Roll, 14th century, uh, gives us how she was viewed in later times. So I'll try and read it for you. Cest a fled, this a fled, est la plus sage de toute femme séculaire. She was the wisest of all secular women. Of course, because she was a ruler, not a, a, a religious woman in a nunnery. Don't pas son sang et son savoir. Elle, elle moult aida son frère Édouard à gouverner le royaume. She, by her, by her knowledge and her intelligence, she participated in the rule of the kingdom with her brother. So that's the kind of person. How do we penetrate back to the? the world of the late 9th century and the early 10th century in which she lived in times of extraordinary danger. Um, if the early 10th century text from Northumbria on the life of St. Cuthbert is right, she and the family were with her father Alfred during the, the, the darkest hour of the Wessex kingdom in 878 in the marshes of Somerset as a maybe an eight-year-old child. But what's certain is that through her life, she understood the, the dangers of the time and she took on the burdens of the time in the way that a male ruler did. That's the background, the Viking Age. The kingdoms, the old kingdoms of England had been dismembered by Viking attacks from the 860s. Northumbria, kings had been killed. Edmund, the keys to the King of the East Angles in uh, 869 had been killed. Uh, Mercia uh, had been broken apart, partitioned, and a puppet king installed in 874. Only her father's kingdom, Wessex, survived. So um, that's the background to the story. I couldn't resist putting one or two of these pictures in. I love this one in particular. This was from a, uh, a children, Edwardian children's book that my father had uh, and I love the scene, even though we regretfully part with Vikings with winged helmets and all that, but it's in the fens. It's, it symbolizes the story that we're gonna tell really, the destruction of uh, the monasteries burning on the horizon, the destruction of learning, the destruction of rulership uh, as the, these 
enormous, we now understand, professional armies that traversed the kingdom. Um, the recent excavations at Torxey, for example, in Lincolnshire, Viking camp, 55 hectares, about a mile along the Trent, many thousands of people, the excavators think. So these were massive threats to the survival of a kingdom. Um, and that's the world she will enter into. Now, I've put some of the sources in to show you here, because we're, we're going to grapple this evening with the, the possibilities of biography. Uh, so here's my first source. This is the life of Alfred the Great, uh, written by Bishop Asser, the Welsh bishop who knew Alfred and worked for him, travelled with him, saw some of the key sites of the story. And uh, this is Asser's account. The manuscript doesn't survive. This is the, the 1722 printed edition of the text, which miraculously we have. And this is, this is the background to Athelflaed's life. This is Alfred as a young man, about 869, 868, uh, marrying a Mercian woman from the Mercian kingdom. The kingdoms of Wessex and Mercia had got closer and closer together over this period of enormous threat from Viking armies. And, uh, Alfred's sister was married to the king of the Mercians. And in 868, uh, Alfred marries, as you can see here, uh, a woman, and Asa curiously never names Aylesworth, who is, you can see in the middle of the page, the daughter of an alderman, Ethelred of the Gainey, who were a tribe of the Mercians who lived around Hanbury in Worcestershire. And his nickname was Mikko, in fact, the name of his father and it seems his grandfather or great grandfather. So it's an old a noble line of the Mercians. But the most important thing for our story is, is the mother, um, the grandmother of Athelflaed. And here she's named by Asa, Eadbuch. And she came, as you can see, from the royal line of the Mercian kings. And Asa says here in brackets, and we ourselves have seen her. M many times until her death, frequently seen her, and she was a truly remarkable woman. And for many years after uh, the death of her husband, she lived the life of a, a religious vowess, if you like, of a chaste widow. And Eadbo, who therefore lived with the royal court uh, in the whole time of the upbringing of uh, her granddaughter, Athelflaed, and the mother, Aylesworth. And to me, it's the women of the Mercian royal line who are the key to this story in some ways. That Athelflaed, who will become ruler of Mercia, is the daughter of the great line of the Mercian royal family. And her grandmother, Eadbo, is descended from the last great king of the, of the, the Mercians, Canwulf. So, um, and women in Mercia had a different status from what we can see to, to what they had in Wessex. A hundred years before, King Offa, the great king who built the dike and corresponded with Charlemagne, his wife, Cunethrith, administered the royal household, was a, um, a patron and governor of religious houses, and he even had coins minted carrying her name. So royal women of the Mercian clan a very high status. And that's the world in which Arthur Flood is coming from through her mother and through her grandmother. It's the Mercian female line. And we don't have time tonight to really look at this, but those of you who saw the, the great exhibition two or three years ago at the British Library will have seen some of these manuscripts. This is the, the Nunnerminster prayer book. There are four great prayer books from the early ninth century that survived from Mercia. And uh, uh, this one owned pr probably by Arthur Flood's mother. Um, others perhaps made for and even by women. It's been suggested one of them for a, made for a female physician, but it's special prayers and material on women's health. Um, these carry very characteristic uh, prayers and texts to do with cults that were favoured by the Mercian women of the royal household, especially the cult of the Holy Cross, very moving and powerful prayers. And 
there's a culture there, a Christian Latin uh, culture that uh, is transmitted down to her, even though we don't know whether she was literate or not. So it's worth bearing in mind that her inheritance was this great culture of Mercia, which would be so important to her father in the, um, in the uh, uh, translation projects that he undertook in the 890s. So, um, and so she's born into that. And here's Asa's uh, description um, that the firstborn of King Alfred, and we assume um, born around 870, is Athelflaed. There she is, the, the primogenita. And uh, sadly, it doesn't tell us about her education. Further down, it talks about her younger brothers and their education. Uh, it doesn't tell us. And perhaps because she left the court by the time that Asa uh, joined it from the, the later 880s onwards. But you can see uh, there the description of her marriage briefly. Athelflaed, um, when she came to the time of matrimony, uh, perhaps around 16 or 17, maybe mid 80s, late 80s, married Ethelred, Eadredo, uh, Asa calls him the alderman of the Mercians. So she, that's when she goes to, um, leaves Wessex behind, leaves her father's court behind and goes to Mercia to be the lady of the Mercians. He's the, Ethelred is the lord of the Mercians. She is the lady of the Mercians, the domina Merciorum, the hlaftige in English, Merciorum. Now at that time, it's important to understand, um, Alfred had won a series of tremendous victories against the, the Danes and become the preeminent king of the surviving English kings. And, and he starts to call himself the king of the Anglo-Saxons, meaning the joint kingdom of the Saxons of Wessex and the Anglians of, of Mercia. So he's the preeminent king. And Ethelred and uh, Athelflaed, his wife, never take the title king or queen in, in official documents, although that's how they're seen by people abroad, for instance, in Irish chronicles. And, um, but they rule Mercia still in, on the understanding that it is a kingdom. Here's a, a charter from issued at Shrewsbury in 901, quite far into their joint reign, in which they are, uh, with God's grace, uh, holding uh, in an, uh, with honour, governing and defending the monarchia of the Mercians. So even though they're not presumably allowed by Alfred to hold the title of king or queen, they are, as it were, uh, in a regal position. They are holding the monarchy of the Mercians. Now, rulership, what did it involve? Well, we'll see as we go along, from leading armies to fighting battles, uh, but especially to protecting the kingdom. What Alfred was faced with after his victory of 878 was the necessity to fortify the land, to build fortified places that enabled the population to take refuge. Nobody in any major center of population would be more than 15 miles away for a, from a, a fortified place. Uh, here's a map which shows you the, the, the fortified bourgs, as they were called, B-U-R-H, bourgs, um, uh, constructed by Alfred. Uh, and we'll see the ones that Arthur Flad constructed in Mercia. So they, they, she and her husband are following on this, this Alfredian plan, which essentially was to, to renovate. They would have used the word in Latin, renovatio, the kingdom of the Anglo-Saxons, by building towns, building fortresses, being, building a network of obligations by which the, uh, the country could be defended. And uh, let me give you one example. It happens to survive in detail in a really wonderful and important document in which Athelflaed and her husband uh, fortify with Alfred's agreement, the, the old town of Worcester. And uh, 
Here we are looking across the cathedral to the, the northern part along the Severn, which is where she extends the, the, the town probably in the 890s. And the document survives with detailed attention to not only the creation of the new fortifications, but uh, the market area and the high street. They're laying out a new part of the town with building plots with specific provisions for, for the market and for commerce and tolls, as well as for defense. Um, the, the beginning of the document says that the, at the request of their friend, the Bishop Wafer of Worcester, uh, Alderman Athelred and Athelflad have ordered the building of the bull at Worcester for the protection of all the people. Uh, fortunately, again, the manuscript was virtually destroyed in the Cotton Fire in 1731 still survives, as you can see, but it was uh, well edited before the fire, so we know what it, what it uh, said. And, and this is a sketch map just to show you what she did, what she and her husband did, because this pattern of constructing fortresses, building um, new towns, uh, creating market areas, new churches, uh, this pattern will be replicated in the astounding series of entries in, the, in what we can call the Athelflad's Chronicle. Um, there's Worcester, the red line is the Roman defences, the green line, the Mercian addition. So it's a major uh, addition, 20 acres perhaps, I can't remember. The black line is the later medieval wall. So you've got the high street, a new high street being laid out with uh, plots for the settlers, uh, the market is being specially laid out. And also you'll notice I've put in three very significant churches, all of which are ancient churches and all of which are cults that are really important to the Mercian royal family. Above all, St. Helena, the finder of the true cross. It's the oldest church in Worcester. It's the mother church of Worcester. It existed before the, the old English takeover of Worcester. It's probably late Roman, and uh, we're going to see that Athelflad probably was, is involved with manuscripts of the finding of the true cross and the story of St. Helena being produced. The cult's are very important to most in royal women. And St. Margaret of Antioch was the same. We'll come to that as well. But there you can see the model for urban construction in the Viking Age. We have to defend. We have to lay plans for the future. And it's a systematic long-term plan, which is following on from what Alfred does. She and her husband, and then she on her own, will continue. Just to stress, though, that they are still subordinates to the king of the Anglo-Saxons. Here's a document from 903, which actually has her brother there. Can you see the trans not transcribed all the names at the bottom, but there's her brother, Edward. There's her... Uh, husband, Ethelred, herself, below the bishops of Warfeth of Worcester, Athelweir, the king's brother, Osfer, the king's close kinsman, and below, Alfwin, the one child of Athelflad. She's, she's the, the one child who at least grew to adulthood of, um, of Earl Athelred and Athelflad. And She's going to be an important part of the story because we talk of Athelflad as the Lady of the Mercians, but there was a second Lady of the Mercians, the daughter. We'll come back to her. So it's at this point that we can start to tell her story in some detail because of this extraordinary survival. It's in the British Library. Both these manuscripts, Cotton Tiberius manuscripts, are digitised, so you can look at them at the wonderful British Library digitized manuscripts, uh, uh, files online, and you can go in closely on the pages and really interrogate them in a way that has never been possible before. And here um, is the beginning in 902 of the Annals of Athelflad. Let's call it that. You can see the red square is where the Annals begin. And curiously enough, in the previous chronicle text before it ends in 915 and then this this new set of annals has been inserted going back to the year 902 so it's an intrusion and the uh, earliest of the two manuscripts of this is from 977 
and the manuscripts uh, follow an exemplar, an earlier version of it. So we don't have the original, but we can see here that somebody in Worcester began to make notes and gradually these notes get more and more expansive. And once Athelflaed is the sole ruler of the Mercians, uh, somebody is anxious to commemorate her story. Uh, I've not transcribed everything because the page would get too busy, but maybe there's a clue in the fact that the very first entry of these annals is the death of her mother, Herr Eallswith Forthfaird. And then a few smaller entries, eclipses of the moon, a comet, and so on. And then a series of annals which begin to tell a story which will run down until the death of Ethelred, her husband, in the middle of the page, Thaothrus Yeris Thassia for Ethelred, Mirchna Harford. And then she starts to be called the Lady of the Mercians, and she's on her own. And she starts to act on her own. She starts to direct military forces on her own. She sends expeditions into Wales. She leads armies, as you can see there in the bottom quote, Herr Goda for um, with the help of God, for Athelflad Mirchna Hlaftiga, she went, mid Erlum Mirchum, with all the Mercian people, to Tamaweorthiga, to Tamworth. And she built the book there in the early summer. The annal goes on to tell us more things, but I'm giving you a flavor of what this remarkable text does. Without it, we wouldn't know. So let's just look at one or two of the things that are singled out there. Uh, first of all, uh, 907, the restoration of Chester. There's Chester, great Roman, great Roman city with a great bend of the River Dee around it. Uh, and uh, what we know that she did in the restoration of Chester, perhaps um, after a heavy Viking Norse Irish attack, which is recorded in the Irish sources. So she's repairing it as well as restoring it. The Roman circuit is the rectangle that's marked on two sides there by the blue, and the red is the huge expansion that um, she and her husband uh, uh, create. And the city will become a major center of commerce and trade, 25 moneyers in within 20 years, you know, the largest number in, 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 uh, in England, uh, partly on the trade with across the Irish Sea, which is a kind of free trade zone, really. And uh, coins are issued, they don't bear her name, but uh, they show the great uh, building work in the right hand side of the coin is the great tower is probably a representation of the restoration of the Roman city of Chester. So um, the renovatio begins. 909, St. Oswald's bones were taken from Bardney in Mercia and brought back to Gloucester. And uh, if you drive around the inner bypassing Gloucester today, you can still see a fragment of the arcade of the beautiful little dynastic church that Athelflad and her husband built there for St. Oswald to, to hold his remains. The excavators, um, believed that the dugout depression at one end of this building had been the remains of a, of a square pillared crypt. And they compared it to what they found in the ground to the surviving Mercian uh, crypt at Repton in Derbyshire with the, the relic um, ledges on three sides, which would have contained the bones of uh, the saints, St. Oswald's remains and were intended to receive the bones of Athelflad and her husband. So this was a dynastic mausoleum and uh, a really important statement in the former Roman city of Gloucester, one of the most important centres that again she'd restored. They're creating, well, it almost sounds dynastic, doesn't it? It's so reeks of the Mercian past. And there's a little interesting little sidelight to this story. Um, Lost annals, lost chronicle, lost poem uh, recounting the life of King Athelstan tells us one or two rather important things that before his death, Alfred the Great had designated Athelstan as a little boy 
as future king and decked him with the regalia of knighthood, the scarlet cloak and the jewel belt and scabbard and the sword. But um, all that came to naught because his father Edward, who's I presume in the right upper right of this beautiful picture, and that must be Athelflaed in the upper left, his father um, booted out Athelstan's mother, to whom he presumably was not married, and married a queen, a woman who was consecrated as queen. So the children of that marriage would be the designated heirs. And Athelstan was packed off to be raised by his aunt Athelflaed in Mercia. Uh, and we'll come back to this story at the end because of where those annals of Athelflaed lead us. But Athelstan never forgot his links with Mercia. And a remarkable document here, which is in the National Archive, tells us that when Athelstan was probably in his mid-teens, sometime 909-910, presuming when the relics of Oswald had been brought back to, to Gloucester, Athelstan swore a pact of paternal piety with his foster father, Athelflaed's husband, a pactum paternae pietatis. Can you see this? It's, lit, it's illuminated on the picture. So you can imagine the teenage Athelstan with his aunt and uncle in that beautiful church, a uh, tiny little church, the bones of St. Oswald, with this solemn pact uh, which he would fulfill. He came back to Gloucester in the first year of his kingship to uh, affirm that pact. And there are other little hints of the importance of his, his time as a as a young prince in Athelflaed's court. He'd found a church in Gloucester. He'd made his pact of paternal piety there. He even died in Gloucester. So these connections bear them in mind. Mercia at that time is, is um, open to attack. Um, Wessex by now, the network of boroughs was and fortifications was right across towards Kent. And, uh, the river valleys were defended, the estuaries were defended, the big towns like Winchester had rebuilt. But the heartland of Western Mercia, beyond Watling Street, that red line, which is the frontier between the, the Danelaw and the, and the English, was open to attack. And around the time of that uh, pact of piety, in 910, a great uh, invasion came down from Northumbria, burning and looting as they crossed Watling Street down into the heartland of Mercia, the Severn Valley, all the way to the Bristol Avon, then up on the crossing over to the, the western side of the Severn um, before it was intercepted near Tetton Hall in Staffordshire and suffered an absolutely crushing defeat. Um, we don't know who the leadership were. It was a joint Mercian and West Saxon army. Presumably the leadership was uh, Athelflaed and her husband, but it's possible that by now her husband uh, was in very poor health, maybe through wounds or through sickness or through age, and she was taking the lead in all these things. Because that same year, in response to this attack, uh, if we go back to the annals, we discover um, in the middle of the page the battle, and the same year, the Ilchan year, Athelflaed ye timbre de tambour at Bremesburg. Um, her husband isn't mentioned anymore, although he's still alive. She ordered the fortification to be made at Bremersburg. And, uh, and the fortification, I think, if you look at the two great roads that lead out of Mercia, the Foss Way going up to Leicester and Icknell Street going from Worcester to Derby, that, main, that line down, which is probably the line taken by the army in 910, the invading army, goes through Bromsgrove, Bremersgraf. And uh, to me, that's much the likeliest place for Athelflaed's first sole construction. Uh, it's got all the characteristics of a late Saxon town. It's first in Doomsday Book, with uh, many subsidiary holdings and estates. It's a classic late Saxon borough. And, and I think that's the, that's the place. And she did it in specific response to the attack of, uh, of 910. Uh, and now the annals start to 
get more particular. She's described as the lady of the Mercians and the adjectives used by the analyst, uh, uh, the, the descriptions, the, the, the almost breathless uh, additions to the text. It was with God's grace. It was with God's help. She went with all the Mercians to Tamworth. Now, Tamworth was over the, uh, Tamworth, as you can see there, is just over the Watling Street in Danish territory, and presumably have been held by the Danes since 874. But it was the old capital, the old residence of Offa and Athelbald and the great Mercian kings. So it's almost a kind of redemption. And she goes with the army. That's She went with all the Mercians. So by 913, she's actually leading these expeditions and she restores Tamworth. And indeed, the um, excavations at Tamworth have been able to show the line of her defences. And then it opens up. And uh, I've constructed this map to give you a sense of her campaigns between 913 and 915. It's an amazing image, isn't it? Don't you think? Uh, I've got her coming back for Christmas to Worcester. I, uh, I, but of course, it could have been Gloucester. But Worcester was her her main centre, I think, intellectually, her closeness to the bishops there. She had her own house in a big haga uh, in the northern part of the circuit that she'd built. So let's put her in Worcester and just see now what's happening. 913, she crosses Watling Street, takes Tamworth, refortifies it and garrisons it. The same campaign, she goes up to Stafford and creates a, a fortress there. She comes back for Christmas. Then in 914, she heads all the way up to the North Cheshire Plain and fortifies, refortifies an old Iron Age hill fort at Edisbury, in a very strategic place looking out towards the, uh, in between the valleys of the Dee and the Mersey. And then, as you can see, she comes all the way down later in the year to the other side of English Mercia, to Warwick, uh, close by the Foss Way, where another huge fortification is built. It's still the basis of the fortifications of Warwick today. She presumably came back again for the heartland to, of Worcester, to, uh, to, of Mercia, to enjoy um, Christmas. And then in 915, she goes out to the Welsh border. So she's looking three ways, really. She and her commanders, my friends, as she called them, um, the, the men who are named in her, her charters. She's looking towards the Watling Street frontier, with Warwick, Tamworth and Stafford. She's looking north towards the vulnerable point of the Dee and the Mersey and incursions there. She's also looking to the Welsh borders. And in 915, she constructs a boar at Cherbury. And shortly afterwards, one at a place which has not been identified called Weardburg, the, the Watch Fort. We'll come back to that. And then goes all the way back up to, to the Mersey to construct a boat at Runcorn on the Narrows, where the Mersey estuary um, uh, closes in in the landscape there, the very narrow point. Let's just look at one or two of those, give you a sense of what she's doing. There's the fort at Edisbury near the forest of Delaware and the North Cheshire Plain. Big Iron Age hill fort, re-fortified, sizable garrison. Uh, needed to fortify that, and they probably leave garrisons behind, as well as reorganizing the local militias. Um, there's the there's the narrows coming from the you know, Mersey, stretching away to the left, and uh, coming down from the right. The narrows at Runcorn, where any of you travelled up by train, you remember the famous bridge goes right over the river at that point with the church, which she founded and endowed with saints bones of St. Bertolin, uh, right there on the edge of the river. Um, they may even have done what they did in Carolingian Francia, which is to have another fort on the other side and link it with chains. And uh, Weardburg, I mentioned, out in the Welsh borders. I think that it's the Watchburg is this place, Coast Castle, near Westbury, uh, a few miles west of Shrewsbury on the Great Road Tradeway into Wales. Um, this book, although it's not been identified, would be a mint under Athelstan, probably under Edgar. And so it was a substantial urban settlement on the Welsh border. And uh, 
this fits all our requirements, I think. And Westbury below it is where Doomsday, where the Anglo-Saxon Chronicles, sorry, says that um, the weird men, the watchmen on the Welsh border were based in, in the 11th century. So this, this looks like the place to me. And if it is, um, then imagine her there with her army and her leaders in the, the late summer of 915, because the entry in the, the annals of Athel Flood, three entries down, so it's just below halfway, you can see Weirdbiach, Weirdbuch, and, and the same year uh, he, she goes up to Rumkulf and Runcorn. And um, we can pick her up September the 9th, 915, because again, miraculously, given how few documents survive, here in this wonderful cartulary from the British Library is, there she is, a beautifully painted picture of her, is her charter issued at the fortress of Weirdburg. Um, we're looking at the left-hand column, uh, we're looking at the date in, right in the middle, uh, the 9th of September, in the place called Weirdburg, and there she is with her thanes and her nobles, the, the, the bottom four names with crosses by them are the four bishops of, of Mercia. The sixth name is, you can see, is Ego Athelflad, um, confirming the document and not requiring the permission of her brother to do it. And below her, misassigned as a bishop in the abbreviation, but we've already got the four bishops of Mercia, her daughter, Alfwin. And uh, probably in her late 20s by now, but now being groomed as the successor, one would imagine. So it's a really crucial document, brilliant document. Uh, she is constructing a new borough. She's refurbishing an Iron Age hill fort, new defences, establishing settlers in it, and uh, probably has a dedication ceremony. This is only days before the ceremony of the, the Holy Cross, uh, one of the most important ceremonies for the Mercian royal women. So everything comes together in that document. Out of all this, what can we imagine? Well, first of all, uh, of course, in medieval chronicles, they're always anxious to attribute the, to give the credit to actions and deeds and battles and wars to the ruler. But this set of annals is very distinctive. It tells us she sent an expedition to um, Langors Lake to, um, to punish a Welsh raid. She herself went with the army to Tamworth and so on. These are specific. It allows us perhaps to conjecture that she as the leader would be there when these, uh, these boroughs were laid out, when the streets were laid out. Perhaps she herself went into the field with her generals and her surveyors, as documents describe late Saxon kings doing. Can't be sure she dressed like this. Um, I'm using, to help your imagination here, illustrations from the, the Hexateuch of a, a great biblical manuscript of about the year 1000. And, and um, the experts like Galo and Crocker on women's clothing think that things got Things changed during the 10th century as, as the upper class, driven by the monastic reformers, were, uh, became more religious in their outward appearance as well as in their behaviour, and that women perhaps were more constrained in some of their roles by that time and, and their clothing possibly. But it, it helps us imagine. She may not have appeared like this with her army at Weird Book. But, and also, she's in the charters with her wise men. She's thanking her friends. She uses that term, my friends. Um, and uh, she therefore is chairing these, these meetings. She's the ruler of the Mercians. She's with honor um, holding and defending the monarchy of the Mercians. So we can only conclude that she was there in those discussions and perhaps leading them as a very experienced daughter of a king, daughter of the royal line of Mercia. She had it both ways. Um, 
And she sends messengers. That's that as much important messages. Uh, ambassadors too, no doubt. The, the annals describe her negotiating with emissaries from, from York and from Leicester and sending missions into Wales. So all those things, we can fairly imagine her doing, the very things that male rulers are supposed to do, that's what she does. And also, going back to that document from Weardburg and the fifth name up on the left-hand side, her daughter is with her at this point now, and in her late 20s, a mature woman, experienced in rulership already for 10 years before this document in 915. So there's the picture of the, the, uh, the defensive network which is being created. I'm not saying she dreamed it all up, but it was evolved with close knowledge of conditions on the ground um, by her and her generals and her advisors and her wise men and so on. And she is seen as the valued leader and loved leader of, in this respect. And, and when you look at that picture, um, I've highlighted with a yellow marker pen, forgive my haste here, you can see the cluster of boroughs around the Mersey and the D, the, the cluster of boroughs that look towards the Watling Street frontier and those on the Welsh border. We're probably missing one or two. Uh, Hereford may well have been the reconstruction of Hereford down at the bottom towards, towards the left done at the same time as some of her early boroughs. There must be something in the middle around Wigmore, um, south of Cherbury along Offa's Dyke. And there's probably two, a couple between Shrewsbury and Chester, the, the great Iron Age hill fort of Oswestry, um, Masbury, the Masbur, the boor on the, on the border. I would imagine was refurbished at that time because the cult center of St. Oswald there the, um, the white minster looks like a 10th century minster. So it's a very wide ranging um, and far sighted set of administrative arrangements to protect the kingdom of Mercia, but also to prepare for the conquest of the Dane law, the lands beyond the red line. And you can see the two great roads, the one between Stafford and Tamworth, Icknell Street going to Derby, and the one Fossway going to Leicester. And that's where she's going to go in 917. First of all, Derby, uh, the expedition to Derby. Uh, you can see there Deorabi in the third line down, and uh, this memorable entry in the annals, which gives us a tiny insight into the way that... Uh, the, the links, the feelings, the relationships between her and her warriors and her leaders, the battle for Derby. She took Derby and she took the territory uh, dependent on it. And in the battle there, the Warren Erch of Slagen here, Thania Four, who were much beloved, the four Thanes were killed fighting inside the gates. Warren Binan Tham Gatto, four of her Thanes who she much loved. I always find this entry very um, touching and illuminating. We all know about the bond between the, the male lord and the warriors. You think of the great Anglo-Saxon poems of exile, you know, the seafarer, the wanderer, uh, how the relationship with the beloved lord is so intense that to be deprived of it causes almost um, paroxysms of depression. I wish I could lay my head on my lord's lap again. Um, the loss of the Lord's love is so great. And the warriors, as in the Battle of Malden poem, are prepared to lay down their lives for their Lord. And there, in that one annal, you've got a suggestion of, of the Mercian warriors, the, the heavily armed warriors, the, the, the spearhead of the army, the Thanes, uh, fighting inside the gate and, being, uh, and losing their lives. Um, it's a, it's a powerful little insight into the link, which keeps being suggested in her charters when she refers to them, not as my, my ministers, or my, but my friends. Um, and that asks all sorts of questions about, uh, also about the court culture and women's culture. 
um, before we move on to the final year of her life and the final year of her campaigns. Um, there are many, many things that we don't know about this period. Um, as I'm sure many of you will know, a lot of the translations sponsored by Alfred the Great were done by Mercians. The Mercian element in the Alfredian translation program was the most significant. Bishop Warfeth, um, the priest Athelstan, the priest Warulf, uh, Plegmund, who became Archbishop of Canterbury. These people were the intellectual bodyguard, the comitatus, if you like, the, the, the native English comitatus of Alfred the Great, the people who provided his translations and translations that came after his, his death, because most of them lived long lives. Warulf died in 914, well into Athelflaed's time as a sole ruler. Athelstan the priest, certainly um, to the time when her husband died. Warulf is still by Athelstan's side in 925. So um, the translation project, there's no reason to think that it ended with Alfred. And in fact, we can be sure that it didn't. The whole drive of it continued. And in Mercia, above all, it was very powerful and continuing and there are many Mercian manuscripts which have yet to be analyzed, dated and really understood. Let me just give you one or two hints. If we think about the fragments that are possible for a future biography, this is a fascinating and important manuscript of uh, Aldhelm, West Saxon saints, a famous treatise on chastity. Um, a crucial manuscript in the whole tradition, the, the, the stem of the manuscripts that run through the 10th century and were so important in the reform period. Uh, and the root manuscript is this one from her circle, from Worcester. Um, under what conditions was this commissioned? Uh, when we think of the life of her mother and her grandmother as religious widows, <clears throat> when we think of the tradition of Athelflaed herself, later tradition, says that after the birth of her only child, Alfwyn, the birth had been so traumatic and so difficult that she renounced sexual relations with her husband and made vows of chastity herself. Um, what do these signify? How far can we go in terms of uh, biography when we, when we look at texts like this? Um, then there's the question of manuscripts concerning the Mercian royal family. A translation of the Mercian royal saint Guthlac comes from her time. And uh, uh, a Latin manuscript uh, survives from her time and a translation, which is, again, uh, with vernacular poetry, these, these texts have not been closely dated. And uh, one hopes with a big collection on Guthlac coming out soon, we may understand what the relationship is of these texts. Latin and Old English and vernacular poems, what relation do they have to the Mercian court at that time? And most interesting, perhaps, is this manuscript, um, Paris, Latin, Bibliothèque Nationale, 5574, uh, almost unknown to specialists in Old English history uh, until very recently. It's, it's only recently been digitized. But here's a manuscript done in her. Worcester, presumably, but surely related to the ideals of her court circle and women's culture, because it contains a series of texts, all of which are about heroic women, um, martyrs, uh, religious women who became martyrs because of their exceptional courage and heroism in the face of suffering, in the face of male violence. Uh, Saint Juliana, uh, an important saint in uh, if you're praying for health and against disease and illness. Um, saint Helena, the, the finder of the true cross. And I've already referred to you the, the importance of that cult to mercy and royal women and the striking fact of the Mother Church of Worcester being probably pre-English, but dedicated to Saint Helen, still there today. Go and see it. Um, and St. Margaret of Antioch, um, saint of childbirth. Um, uh, and again, really remarkable text, this uh, uh, 
which even contains um, exhortations to uh, visit churches, to, um, to have the life copied. Anybody who copies this story and carries it with them will be blessed. Um, the special um, protection for uh, pregnant women and so on. Um, it, it's a very, these are women's texts. And although these stories, of course, are, are um, stories of these saints are, you'd almost say fairy tales, the horrible, uh, the dragons being swallowed by a dragon, um, the, the awful tortures that these women like Margaret endured before their, their deaths. Um, you could see them as fairy tales, but actually for women of this time, one suspects there was great consolation to be had in these texts, which validate their experience and their suffering uh, at the hands of male violence in a world of extraordinary violence, especially towards women. So um, those texts, which are about health and uh, about pregnancy, uh, about bravery and courage and steadfastness are, um, are very interesting products of what might, one might guess was the female court culture of Athelflaed, which we know nothing. Um, and interestingly enough, the relics of uh, St. Margaret of Antioch came to, the, uh, came to Italy in 908. And here's a relic list of King Athelstan, his gifts to Exeter, and uh, there on the right hand column, just above halfway, you'll see the head caput of St. Margaret the Virgin uh, given to Exeter. The life it, that they're translating then uh, is, um, uh, is translated into Old English. It actually says that the head, nobody knew where the head was, but clearly Athelstan's relic purchasers were able to get hold of that. But um, uh, there's a tiny possible connection here, and I, I, I offer this with great diffidence, but this is the Church of East Wellow in, in Hampshire, and uh, uh, it's dedicated to St. Margaret of Antioch, and although it's a 12th century church, it had a, a pre-conquest predecessor. Um, no guarantee that, that dedication goes that far back, but uh, in the will of Alfred the Great, there he is, Alfred West Saxon of Kuning. Um, uh, he leaves one estate to my eldest daughter. And some of, these, some of these bequests are, one can only imagine, sentimental. He gives Wantage his birthplace and Efandun, the site of his greatest victory, to his wife. And to my eldest daughter, one estate, the Ham at Wellow, at East Wellow. Why does he give this one estate to Athelflaed? Of course, he gives her nothing else because she's been married and left his court long ago and she's living in Mercia. But one estate. What's her connection with East Wellow? Was she born there? Was the dedication important to her? It only underlines so many stories that lie behind the texts that are part of the real lived life, the, very, the breath of their lives that we can't answer. So... I'll leave that little thought with you. We're nearly at the end. Um, this is the situation by uh, 917, 918. The kingdom of the Anglo-Saxons under Edward the Elder, with Athelflaed as the Lady of the Mercians, has now pushed its way up to the Mersey and the Trent and the Welland. Uh, Lincolnshire remains part of the, uh, the rule of the kingdom of Northumbria at that time. And now the attacks begin, <clears throat> concerted attacks, with Edward going up towards Stamford and the Welland and Athelflaed pushing the Mercian armies across to uh, Leicester and, and, and further. And now the Mercian annals, by now, as you can see, really detailed texts. Um, if only we had this for the whole the whole decade, our knowledge would be transformed. But um, Leicester surrenders peaceably, the, the Danish army based in Leicester. The men of York then send ambassadors to Athelflaed, uh, offering to take her overlordship. 
they will accept by making promises and giving solemn oaths to her. They will have her as their Lord. Just imagine how the history of the next few years might have gone had she not died. So this is a kind of revolution in the North. And indeed, Irish sources suggest that uh, she actually took forces into Northumbria to uh, fight a battle against a Norse Irish army, helping the King of the Scots at that time uh, near Corbridge. Uh, it's very hard to believe that that story is true, but it's a measure of the reputation that she had by then in the Irish sources, she's referred to as the most famous queen of the Saxons. But <clears throat> after that incredibly busy first six months of the year, first five months of the year, she dies suddenly. We don't know why. Um, in the middle of these things, suddenly, as you can see there, 12 nights before midsummer, Binantaman worthy. The, the eighth year that she had held the rule of Mercia with right lordship, with just lordship. Note the stress. This is a Mercian writer. She was the legitimate ruler of the kingdom of the Mercians. And her body lies in Gloucester, in the porticus of the Church of St. Peter, the little church I showed you. And the verdict, I'd love to know where this came from. For a long time, I persisted in Charles Plummer's idea that the original behind these annals had been written in Latin. Clearly, clearly it was vernacular by uh, somebody who imitated Latin forms in the Old English. And so my long-held belief that this, um, this fantastic uh, um, salute to her from the Chronicle of John of Worcester had come from an earlier text may not be right, but it's, it's full of what I would call Carolingian terms of rulership. And uh, this is what a Worcester Chronicle in Latin said about her death. The Lady of the Mercians, woman of outstanding prudentia, judgment, that is, and justitia, justice, of extraordinary virtus, that strength of character, that means, femina. In the eighth year that she on her own had ruled the kingdom of the Mercians, the kingdom of the Mercians, with strength and justice, she had ruled moderamine, um, but it's a difficult word to translate, but steering it carefully. And she left her daughter as the heir to the kingdom. They keep using the word kingdom and, and implied to in the old English. It's the first and only time I think in British history that a, a daughter succeeded a mother as ruler. And uh, it begs all sorts of questions. Alfwen, um, uh, well, probably in her early 30s now, she becomes the second lady of the Mercians. And 18 months later, it seems, the dates are not absolutely clear, in December uh, 919, her uncle Edward the Elder moves into Mercia, effectively enacting a coup and removes her from power and takes her into Wessex. On West Saxa, I led at Frimwukan er midum winter, three weeks before midwinter. Se was Hatten Alfwin. She was called Alfwin. So the threat of Mercian separatism, possibly, is it? The strength of Mercian feeling? How are we to read this? The answer is we don't know. All we know is that the daughter was removed from power by the uncle. Uh, and uh, that's the last we hear of her. Or is it? Here's a charter from 948. Maggie Bailey drew attention to this. Um, and a very interesting charter given by King Eadred, um, nephew of Athelflaed, 
at the behest of the Queen Mother. Can you see in the third line down, Ead Gifu, Eostem Regis Mate, on behalf of a holy woman, a woman of religious persuasion called Alfwin. Uh, and it would be very interesting. It's a rare name. Only two women in the first half of the 10th century, as far as I know, have it. Uh, it would be extraordinary if this were her. Presumably now in her 60s and resident in a nunnery somewhere in the south of England, never allowed back into Mercia, never allowed to marry. Um, if only we knew. Mother and daughter then, um, the two ladies of the Mercians. And so much still to be discovered from, I believe, from the clusters of vernacular texts and uh, the dating of vernacular poetry um, and some of these Latin texts that have never really been explored. There's a footnote to the story before I finish. You remember the tale of little Athelstan, the five or six year old, his aunt looking down from the top left, um, his mother booted out of the court, replaced by a consecrated queen. Athelstan himself booted off the succession order in favor of his slightly younger half brother, Alfweird, who was born in the purple. Um, Athelstan must have been Mercian in temperament if he spent a lot of time there. He must have understood Mercian traditions and loved his, his, um, his aunt. So, Mercia is under West Saxon rule. We've reached 924, so five years after the abduction of Athelflaed's daughter. And you'll see here, this is from the Textus Refensis. This is the nearest we have to an authoritative, official West Saxon king list. And in the middle of the page, you can see it. After Alfreda van Eadward, his son, Tutharicha, after Alfred, Edward, his son, succeeded to the kingdom. And he reigned for, you can see it there, 24 winters. And then Alfweard, Edward's son, came to the throne and held it for four weeks. Can you see there? On held four weeks. And then Athelstan, his brother, fang to reach it. On Wiglish has thus reach his world, and, and he succeeded to the kingdom and he held it warlike. He was a great king. And what happened after the death of the, the young king, Athelstan's half-brother, was this, which we know from the end, as far as we can tell, of the annals of Athelflad. Whoever wrote that account of Athelflad between 902 and 925, perhaps, um, ended it with what is almost a perfect turning of the circle because um, after the death of Edward, suppressing a Mercian revolt in the summer of 924, then the death of the acknowledged heir, the West Saxon Prince Alfred, the Mercians elect Athelstan king. Now you can see it four lines from the bottom. And Athelstan was according to King of Mirchum, not as king of the Anglo-Saxons, not a king of Wessex, but king of the Mercians. So all those hints that we've seen in the documents of the monarchia of the Mercians, the regnum of the Mercians, uh, that uh, Athelflaed and her husband so carefully tended, um, suddenly came to pass in this constitutional crisis and the Mercians elect Athelstan as their guy, the foster son, the, the nephew of the, of the Lady of the Mercians. So um, that's the story then in brief. And I hope you'll agree there is real food for biographical material in this speculation with so many still unexamined manuscripts. Um, Athelstan becomes the first king of the English he only becomes first king of the English because he's acceptable to the Mercians. He bridges the, the gap between the Mercians and the West Saxons. And I'm sure all his life uh, looked to his aunt as, as his great inspiration. Um, and uh, as soon as he became king, goes back to Gloucester to redeem that promise he made to her and her husband when he was a teenager. 
and indeed he dies there aged 44 um, 15 years later so um, there's two ways of telling this story of the creation of the kingdom of of all the english and uh, there's the the version that we get in our history books and then there's the version that was almost erased. The official version of the West Saxon version of the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle doesn't mention her at all, except at her death, when she is described as simply the king's sister. So um, it always pays to look at these sources from different points of view, doesn't it? Thank you very much. A warm thank you to you, our audience, and a special thanks to Professor Michael Wood. Please remember to send feedback if you can, and also keep an eye on the British Library's What's On pages to see what's coming up in the future. Please also check out HistFest's website, www.histfest.org. Thank you. Mm -hmm.